Hi everybody, Dr. Friedman here. We are still in the middle of student-directed reading, viewing, and playing. And this week is a response to student requests for computer-based games. We've looked at Twine earlier in the semester um, and the kind of uh, foundational underpinnings of interactive fiction and uh, the way that narrative game structures are often composed in that kind of very simplified decision tree style. Uh, but students wanted to take a look at something a little bit more elaborate, and I can think of nothing quite so elaborate as Disco Elysium, which was first released in 2019 and re-released this year with a kind of expanded authoritative final cut. It's available on lots of platforms now, which is really handy. It's available in the Apple App Store, and because I work in a Mac ecosystem, that meant that I could also include put the put it on my work uh, computer and bring the game into class with me, which is always very handy. I cannot assume that students are going to pay for a $39 game that they may or may not have the technological capacity to play. So while I did offer the possibility of students playing this game as their expected task for the week, I also went through YouTube looking for some of my favorite versions of Let's Plays, playthroughs of this game and pulled two episodes each of those playthroughs and put them into Perusal for student annotation. I selected more than one option, not because I assumed that students were going to look at all of them, but because I know that with playthroughs, there's still a certain amount of rapport with the player that the viewer needs. And so it can be a turnoff to have to navigate with, you know, um, you know, a particular voice or a particular play style. And so I wanted students to be able to, if they got irritated by one, they could, you know, kind of very quickly switch to another option. So that was the logic behind that. And it seems to have worked. Uh, the majority commented on the first option given, but you know, there were a couple of people looking at different ones. Because the, the you know, playthroughs t are timed somewhat differently, um, many first episodes, but not all, spend a lot of time in character creation. And so I decided that I would spend Tuesday's class looking at the character creation mechanics of Disco Elysium, what they're kind of promising to the player as they set up. And then we would look at the very first kind of dialogue cues as the ancient reptilian brain um, and the limbic system uh, engage with the player. And I think it went really well. Students had really smart things to say about what we might call um, the mise en screen or the placement of elements on the screen that you interact with. Um, notably, uh, Disco Elysium is a very text heavy game. Every, every word of text is spoken aloud, but it's also visible on screen. And it's not on the lower thirds, but instead it's along a column so that uh, there's more space for those words and so that you can kind of scroll up to previous um, parts of the dialogue in case you missed it. So that was script-like uh, to the eye of my uh, theater design production student and myself. Smart things about the color story, about the artistic influences. There's definitely some psychedelia as well as some impressionist painting kind of vibe going on. Um, and as I talk to students about, one of the things about this game that's promised from its very title, Disco Elysium, is this kind of interesting juxtaposition between mass culture and concepts of eternity and the afterlife. Uh, it's a game where you can die really easily and quickly, and so we talked a little bit about how death works in different games that we've played in different mechanics. Uh, several students talked about the mechanics of death in Dark Souls, for example. And so we started to talk about the mood of this uh, this game. One of the first things I do in every class is ask how my students are doing using the uh, free to use polling software Mentimeter. Um, 
The other thing that I ask, I use that as a space where students who are not likely to talk up um, can ask questions or react totally anonymously. And I just want to share, because they're awesome, the uh, answers to the question of how would you describe Disco Elysium to someone who didn't know about it, all of which are accurate. Hobo cop with me zero memory and a wild journey ahead. A baller point and click adventure where choices matter. Overwhelming. Stupid, but like in a smart way. Unsettling. And a moody dystopian world in which you, a character with no important memories, navigates this world's mental and social obstacles while working in the criminal environment. Like, bravo, brava. Um, and so we talked about these. What's nice is this gets projected on the screen um, on several screens in our room and we can kind of talk about like how would we refine these? Which are these of these is most resonant? And what do we mean by point and click adventure? Um, point and click is an is a method of interaction. And as I reminded students, it's not a technology that's always existed in gameplay um, that the adventure genre actually predates the invention of the computer mouse um, because before there was clicking, there was text entry. And of course, uh, you know, kind of all the way back to, um, you know, ancient times for them. Um, even I was a child. So anywho, so uh, what was interesting was uh, to talk about point and click, we had different frames of reference. Uh, and as I mentioned, um, for me, the touchstones are still games that you can play. Uh, the games uh, by Sierra and by Lucas Arts in the height of the golden age in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, you can watch Amy Dolan play King's Quest on Twitch on Sundays, um, for example. Um, I am particularly fond of, um, you know, Monkey Island, even though it has aged unevenly in some case, in some ways. Um, and so we talked about... Uh, the ways that this game is different from some of the previous versions of the adventure game or the point and click. We, our perspectival character is also a mystery and becomes a Rorschach test for ourselves. Um, depending on the choices that we make um, for this character, this character becomes a very different kind of person not just in terms of stats, but in terms of the way that they see the world and are able to function in it. Which is why, as I told my students, when I originally imagined this channel that we are, we are watching me on, it was originally designed uh, that Emily and I would play this game and other games like it um, with our friends to see what their reactions are because this is the kind of game that I want everyone I know to play because I want to know the choices. I could watch people play this game unendingly. Um, and I have. It's it's kind of it's kind of weird. Um, and I accept that about myself because I'm old and can't accept things about myself. Anyway, so we we did that kind of talking about the impression, um, first impressions of the dialogue. And there's a gravelly voice of the reptilian, ancient reptilian brain. And I reread those dialogue cues um, with no sound, like I muted the game and just reread them with a completely different kind of line reading. Um, and so the first, uh, the first line ends, you know, and because the first dialogue loops in um, Disco Elysium are, you basically have to choose life again, even though every potential way that that's framed is painful and cruel and negative um, but in order to break out of the kind of loop of eternity and actually go into a narrative progression you have to accept like from the very beginning that the world is difficult and dark and harsh um, and that's kind of the first principles that the player has to accept in order to enter the world of the game beyond the oblivion of darkness. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to note was, while this is a menacing voice, what's actually being said in those early dialogue cues in, in terms of, you know, staying in oblivion are quite seductive, especially right now. If, if a voice came to me and said, you don't have to do anything anymore. Hard not to be swayed by that. Hard not to find that peaceful. 
but it's precisely because the line reading is you don't have to do you know is very gravelly and low and has this ominous voice uh, ominous uh soundtrack behind it that it it puts the hairs on the back of your head uh up um of course then i read it as perkily as i could and creeped the hell out of my students you don't have to do anything anymore and they were like that's creepier and then we unpacked why that's creepy and the different kinds of creepy the creepy of contrast versus the creepy of like you know everything layered on top of each other you know in order to creep you out um in um complementary ways as opposed to contrasting ways but we finally did after much uh discussion get out of that loop and uh started to move towards the start of the game but we're going to talk about the, the 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 actual game itself on thursday that's when i can feel very clear that students will have spent at least an hour watching the actual game as played um and uh, so this is the penultimate uh, week of class where we're structured, uh, we have structured tasks. Next week, we'll be playing Alice is Missing. So the other thing that I reminded students is that they need to bring a cell phone next week um, and agree on a messaging system. Um, I'm excited about it. Uh, it has won Indicade Awards now um, as of two, a few days ago. Uh, so it's even more award-winning than ever before. It's a game that has a tight time structure and uh, can be played silently. So I think it's going to work really well. Uh, stay tuned next week for my thoughts on that. Um, and just so folks know, um, this channel will continue even when we move into unstructured time with the students um, as I start to think about the semesters to come. Uh, next semester, I am teaching a core literature course that is taught um, in what we call the large format, which is 100 students and four GTAs. So that means a different kind of audience and a different scope of texts under consideration, but I am going to be incorporating games into that class as well. So I'll talk um, more about how I'm doing that and how I'm thinking about that in the weeks to come. And we've put in our course requests for next year, uh, and we have a list of course numbers and course topics uh, that are offered on a rotation. And so we all in the faculty put in our requests for what we think we would be most suited to. And um, so what is highly likely is that in the 2022-23 school year, I will be teaching an 18th century graduate course and possibly one other upper division course, which I'm waiting to see what that will be. Um, if I am assigned 18th century um, specific uh, courses, I will be taking my cue from this channel and playing the 18th century, um, pairing canonical and non-canonical works of the long 18th century, that is uh, 1660 to 1835, with games that are set in those periods, reimagining those periods, adapting that literature, everything from Spiral Atlas's indie uh, adaptations, of Jane Austen games into interactive fiction to uh, the Zweihander Flames of Freedom RPG that reimagines the kind of pre-American Revolution moment. I'm excited about that possibility. Um, it's also possible uh, this department has uh, several numbers in popular culture, um, which would mean that this class, this class you are hearing me talk about right now, could be basically rerun uh, obviously with lots of tweaks and one of the things that I will talk about at the end of our semester is a kind of recap video of the ways that I will restructure this class having run it uh, one time. Um, some of the ways that this class was or originally structured were based on where we are in this particular moment at this particular time uh, and using kind of aff affordances that came up across the semester. Um, and so that's going to change uh, in the years to come. Uh, and so I'm excited about that. I'll also, of course, talk more about um, other ways of thinking for my teachers who are watching this. But that's all in the future. For now, uh, it was a good day talking about a great game and one that I highly recommend. Until Thursday, take care.